Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Thank you for joining us today. You are listening to Deeper, your daily Bible study. Today is Tuesday, March 12, and we are looking at the lesson titled, Drying Up the Euphrates River. We will continue our march through Revelation chapter 16 and dive in now to the sixth uh, plague of the seven last plagues. Before we do that, however, we need to pause for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the Bible. Thank you for the warnings and the messages and the encouragement contained in it. Today, as we look at a rather challenging portion of Revelation, we ask that you would guide and direct and lead us with your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, David, uh, yesterday we were looking at the beginning, the first half of Revelation 16. We were looking at what is accomplished by the first four plagues. And we discovered that one of the purposes, perhaps the major purpose of the first four plagues, is to bring the inhabitants of earth, those that have accepted the mark of the beast, to the realization that they are fighting against God, against the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. And this is very clear from Revelation 16, verse uh, 9, where it says, The men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. So a very conscious decision here on those uh, that you know have already rejected the gospel and, and Christ, but they do it again here. They're just hardened in this decision. Uh, and so again, to summarize, the first four plagues bring the inhabitants of earth to the realization of the truth that there is a God, that he is not pleased with what humanity is trying to do, and that they are essentially fighting against him. Now, David, today, as we continue forward into the sixth plague, we're going to discover that one of the important purposes of the sixth plague is to reveal deception to this same group of people. First, God reveals the truth. Hey, you're fighting against me. And now in the sixth plague, he's going to reveal uh, the, the system that has deceived them. And uh, we're going to see this played out here. David, let's start reading in Revelation 6, verse right. 12. Yeah, go ahead, David. I, I wanted to tell you um, just to to for our listeners that we're not really necessarily um, <clears throat> jumping over the fifth plague. It's just that the fifth plague is clearly, and if you can actually read it, verse 10 and 11, it, it's, it's, an, it's a plague that comes specifically upon the beast. It says upon the seed of the beast. So, it, and again, the people that worship the beast and were followers, they blaspheme God because of that, of their pains and their sores, and, and they repent in other deeds. So uh, it, it sort of sets up why the sixth plague is so important and relevant in the in the study, and so today we're gonna, you know, I just wanted to add that up. Uh, and let me read, actually, as you mentioned, uh, verse twelve uh, of of the okay. Revelation sixteen. It says, "And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared." Thank you. And I'll just say this as well for some of our listeners that maybe have joined us more recently. If it sounds like David and I interrupt each other sometimes, that's because we are. We can't see each other. I'm in Missouri and he's in uh, Florida recording this. And so sometimes the only way to uh, get our thought across is to interrupt. So we apologize <laughs> for that, but I think it's working. Thank you, David. You've read uh, Revelation 16, verse 12. And here we have reference to the great river Euphrates. Now, this mm -hmm. is... Uh, a, a symbol rich with meaning here. We can look mm -hmm. at it a couple of different ways, which we'll try to do. First of all, let's take it generally. In Bible prophecy, water represents something, and the Bible is very clear about what that represents. Uh, David, one of the verses we could go to is Revelation 17, uh, verse 15. Right. Where we read, uh, mm -hmm. the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And so uh, Euphrates, of course, a body of water here. Uh, one meaning of this symbol is that it represents people. Uh, but David, in what sense, or, or why would this symbol of, of water or a river be brought in now at this point uh, in the prediction of the plagues? 
Well, uh, for one thing, uh, it, it's not just a regular river, it's Euphrates River. And River Euphrates was uh, is a reference to the location where back in the Old Testament, Babylon would sit. Babylon was actually fed through the river Euphrates. The Euphrates was the river that would come through the city of Babylon and will give its water. It will give them their uh, livelihood, you know, to the city. And uh, <clears throat> these, the reason is to you know, have to understand, you know, the, this, the beast, which is Babylon, the spiritual Babylon, this system, it's only there and supported by the people. The people of the world who have wandered after the beast, who have supported the beast, who have willingly or consciously or by force, it doesn't really matter, but they have accepted its rulership and its dominion over them. So as he's telling us here is that somehow this plague will help or will do that the People who support it, you know, this river of Euphrates, who is feeding this 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 system, who who is really f- flowing its its support, will somehow stop. It will dry up. So it, it is, is is a really reference into the people. The world will stop wandering after the beast, if you want to put it that way. Mm. Now I'm going to interrupt you, and I can do it because I warned people that I was going to. <laughs> Please um, do. Um, one reason that this is so important to realize, and you mentioned it, is that Babylon, spiritual Babylon, is supported by the people. In other words, it is a political uh, machine. (laughs) This is a political beast. Even though it has a veneer of religion, of spirituality, at its core, it relies on the support of people, and that is the definition of politics. Right. Right. now, we're not really studying the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel, but I just want to refer to it because here you can see this played out again. There was one man, one faithful man in Israel, uh, at least that was there that day. Exactly. Um, and his name was Elijah, and he stood up alone. That's not politics. That's called faith. And he stands up alone against how, how many was it? 950 prophets of Baal? Yeah. Uh, hundreds of prophets of Baal. Mm-hmm. And 850. And they are there because they are supported, they, they believe, by the people and by each other. That's politics. And so you have on Mount Carmel this standoff between faith and politics, for less of a, a lack of a better word. <laughs> yeah, um, right. And, and, of course, that's not to say that everyone involved in politics is going to end up on the wrong side. The point is, here is a system that controls the world, and it receives its power from what it thinks uh, the people want or from deception of the people rather than receiving power from the word of God. And that's really the battle of Armageddon uh, in a nutshell here as we continue moving forward. Now, David, uh, you made reference to ancient Babylon uh, in the story of uh, Daniel chapter five. We could probably turn there for a couple of minutes and draw some interesting parallels. Uh, As you mentioned the city Babylon literally sat, it straddled the river Euphrates. The river literally went under the city walls. They had big iron gates that went down through the walls into the riverbed. Um, This was the lifeblood of the city Babylon. And in Daniel 5, we have the story of how Babylon falls. Some very interesting details here. Um, First of all, if you're familiar with the story, uh, King Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, the king who had taken Daniel and his friends captive, now his grandson Belshazzar is in command, and he makes this great feast for a thousand of his lords. And David, it's really interesting. What do they do here in Daniel 5.1? He calls a thousand of his friends, minions, whatever. (laughs) Yeah, they make a great... what does he have them do? Right. They make uh, make the feast to drink wine before the thousand, you know, to drink wine. That's right. Just one of these parallels because, of course, there's the wine of Babylon that's mentioned in right. Revelation. Uh, and Another thing they do. Continued skin- right. Another thing they do, if verses 2 and 3, just to, you know, move in time, we cannot, uh, we see that mm-hmm. they make, you know, they use the temples, the vessels, the of the of the silver vessels that were taken from the temple of God. So they they mock, they take, you know, the things of God lightly and they mock them. So they mock the temple of God. Mm-hmm. 
That's followed then by idolatry in Daniel 5.4, where they drank wine and they praised the gods of gold and of silver, silver. of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Mm -hmm. uh, so a complete rejection of, of God, complete rejection of truth, and a really a mockery, as you said, of uh, the uh, temple of God as well, which had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. So then the, the hand appears on the wall, uh, this supernatural hand severed, and it writes those mysterious words on the wall. Nobody can interpret it. Finally, uh, the queen mother remembers Daniel, who at this point is a very old man. Daniel comes in. God enables him to interpret uh, these words, which is basically spelling out the doom for Babylon. And at that very moment of time, David, what is happening outside uh, the city? Of course, through history, we know that Cyrus was uh, had dried up, had moved the flow of the river Euphrates, and it had made a way so that Euphrates would stop flowing into Babylon. They thought they could be secure, and, and they, by all means, they felt they were secure in this in the, within the city. For for they, I mean, there was no way you, you could actually hold a siege to the city because the river will continue feed and and they will have food. I mean, you know, they felt so secure in the in the city that they never thought. Uh, they could be overcome by anyone. But Cyrus, uh, and I believe God, of course, gave him the sermon to do this. He put the the, the river, the, he moved the river's flow. And by taking away the flow of the river, the river dried up. And so they were able to walk underneath the, the walls of the city into, into the city and destroy it and take over. And all of this is typical or symbolic uh, prophetic of what happens here at the end under the sixth plague as people realize, again, the river represents people, they begin to realize that this system that they've placed their trust in called mm -hmm. Babylon is unable to protect them against the God of heaven. I have a very uh, powerful statement here from Great Controversy, page 655, speaking of this exact time. I'm quoting here, the people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now, in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception, and the multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds. The very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. Again, that's from Great Controversy, page 655. Mm -hmm. Very uh, sobering picture of what is happening here at the very end. And we're going to continue our study tomorrow uh, of the sixth plague because there's more that happens. There's uh, frogs and, and spirits of demons and so forth. Uh, and so we can't cover it all today. We'll continue looking at that tomorrow. But here's, here's the take-home point for today. One of the purposes of the plagues is to bring the people of earth to the realization first that they're fighting against God and to demonstrate, as we saw yesterday, that even when they realize that, they refuse uh, to be changed. They refuse to acknowledge God's authority. And then in the sixth plague here, we see that the deception of Babylon is unmasked and people now are, uh, I guess, in a sense, they're able to see reality as they have not before. And all of this is necessary that God's righteous judgment can be demonstrated so that people will realize that he is just and he is fair in his judgments. Well, we're out of time yeah. today. I hope that you've been blessed by the time spent in God's word. Uh, reminder, you can go to our website at pathwaytoparadise.org. You can find study guides, uh, teacher helps, and so forth. We look forward to studying with you again tomorrow. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.